from PRX. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time. You know, there's a thing called floating. I've never done it before. It's definitely on my like one day wish list. Uh, this will be. This is a story about a, fl- a fish that d- that f- floats sometimes. You know, f- I also heard from Sandra J. Bullock that uh, hope floats. I've never seen, just like I've never float, never seen hope floats. Watching hope floats while I float, it, but floating, you're supposed to be uh, sensory, low on sensory stuff, right? So while I float, not the best time to talk, watch hope floats. Uh, was Sandra Bullock's character named Hope? Like, uh, anyway, not important. You could let me know, though. I love it. Uh, Especially if you say it's a great film, um, but you say, "Sir, what are you even talking?" I thought, I thought, I ch- I ch- I'm here to listen to a sleep podcast, and all I'm hearing is a bunch of nonsense. And I say, "You're correct on that one." But coming up here is a long, meandering uh, intro. Oh, this. Oh, coming up is Sleep with Me podcast, a podcast that's here to put you to sleep because you deserve a good night's sleep. It is, as, as part of my brain already said does take some getting used to. It's a very different show. So give it a few tries. I'm here to keep you company while you drift off. Take your mind off of stuff. Be your friend in the deep, dark night because you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a place you could get some rest. So maybe I could keep you company and take your mind off whatever's keeping you awake. What'll happen here is we're going to have some support. That's how we're able to be free twice a week. Then there'll be a long meandering intro, which is a big part of the podcast, a show within a show to ease you into bedtime. And then there'll be a nice crossover episode, bedtime story about a fish, giant friendly fish, it's called. So that's it. It's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. And these sponsors are how we're able to do it for you for free twice a week. All right, everybody, it is time to talk about tonight's sponsor, Helix. Get over to helixsleep.com, and I want you to take that two-minute sleep quiz, helixsleep.com slash sleep. Let me know what mattress you get matched with. You know, I have the Helix Dust Deluxe. That's because I sleep hot. I sleep on my side. I sleep on my stomach. But Helix has a bunch of different mattress models to choose from, and I want you to start the new year right. Think about your sleep and think about the mattress you have. Take that quiz. Just see what you get matched with. Let me know helixsleep.com slash sleep. Helix is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses that are based on your unique sleep preferences. They have 14 unique mattresses and includes a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, even a mattress for kids. And I talked about how that Helix quiz helps you match a mattress that works best for you. And that personalized mattress is shipped straight to your door free of charge. And Helix knows there's no better way to test out a mattress than at home by sleeping on it. And that's why they have a 100 night risk-free trial you get to try out your new helix see how your body adjusts if it's not the best fit you're welcome to return it for a full refund and as i said helix knows everybody's unique everybody sleeps different that's why they have so many different mattress models to choose from there's models with memory foam that provide a pressure relief if you sleep on your side models with more responsive foam that cradles your body uh, if you're a stomach or back sleeper enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating and if your spine needs some extra tl See, every Helix mattress is a hybrid design that's individually wrapped steel coils with premium foam layers on top. Perfect combination of comfort and support. Like I said, I love my Helix Dusk Lux. Keeps me cool, keeps me comfortable. And not only is it the best mattress I've slept on, but it's so fast and easy. Comes straight to your door, ship for free. Helix mattresses are American made. They come with a 10 or 15 year warranty, depending on the model. And you get to try it out 100 nights risk free. So take that quick. If you don't love it, I mean, I know you will, but if you don't, they'll pick it up for you, give you a full refund. And if you don't want to take Scoots' word for it, Helix was the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired Magazine, recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. So take that quiz, helixsleep.com slash sleep. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash sleep. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Thanks, everybody. 
All right, everybody, it is time for the Sleepy Supporter Zone, the one part of the podcast I need you here. It's where I pop my peas, if you please. I thank the listeners who supported the sponsors, and that's how we come out free twice a week, is the listeners who take action. And you probably heard my message say we got a, a few sponsors with great free trials. We've got a few sponsors right now with great free tools, Helix, Progressive, and ZocDoc. So please check those out. There's also another free way to help the show, which is just spreading the word, whether it's in person, on social media, or in a forum, you, you know, that's more private or whatever let me know about it fill out the form at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash refer and let me know and i'll say thank you i can send you a thank you video if you refer the show uh and tag me on social media when you do it so i can say thanks as well that's sleepwithmepodcast.com slash refer i really appreciate it the show grows because of word of mouth from people like you you know let people know your honest experience um and i'll try to even thank you here on the sleepy supporter zone that's the first part of the sleepy supporter zone the second part is you getting the support you need need right now. If you're in need of extra resources, there's links to resources, including international resources you can connect with right now. So please use those. It's also about being a part of a community and positive change, not just saying Black Lives Matter, not just saying stop AAPI hate, not just saying support Ukraine. And of course, more and more, wherever you could take action to be part of positive change. And there's resources for some places where you could start to learn more and take action in our show notes. But one of those is join in our community as we build hygiene kits for people experiencing homelessness. You could sign up for our newsletter. That's where everything happens at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash midnight mission. And the links to everything are in our show notes as well in your podcast app, including links to the crossover episode we're doing tonight. Also part of community, podcasting community we're a part of. This is a crossover episode with the podcast, The Quiet Journeys of Professor Atwood. So check out the original episode. It's another cool sleepy podcast. And there's a link to the episode right in our show notes. And uh, what do you say? We, oh, oh, Mystery Bard, a lot of people help out on this show. Who are they? Chris Posty Poster Song. Sounds like an earful. Wrote the theme song. Edits episodes too. Carl W. The Legend. Also edits episodes too. Ashley, Kenny, Scotty, Jennifer. Runner, 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 runner. Eric and the team write us down or on the website. I am the Mystery Bard. I do the lullabies, yeah. I do commissions at JonathanMan.net. I'll write a song for you. You see the kindness shine straight on through When the listeners form their own Facebook group Keith, Stacy, Sarah, Julie, and Jennifer These are your moderators Get support, dear Scooter, on Patreon Buy the merch and support the sponsors You can find anything you want At sleepwithmepodcast.com And we're so proud that we could dance Rusty Biscuit, Lois, and I like banana. Leah does the transcripts. Thanks, Mystery Bard. Uh, what do you say we slow it down and get on with the show? Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble, getting to sleep, trouble, staying asleep? Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do it with a bedtime story, so all you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play, and we'll do the rest. What we we're going to what I'm, what, I'm, what we're going to attempt to do, uh, what, what I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could. Say, I mean, I guess we're doing it together, but you don't have to do anything. So that's why I was laughing, because you don't got to do anything. Don't worry. I'll be like I'll be doing something, but it'll, like I'm the only person that when I'm active making this podcast, you see, is he really doing anything? And I say, well, yeah. Uh, but what I'm what I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake, whether that's thoughts on your mind, like thoughts about the past, the present, the future, feelings, anything coming up for you emotionally. Uh, like uh, that you say, okay, I got these feelings coming up or these leftover, f you know, you know what I'm saying? Feelings, feelings. Oh boy. Yeah. I'm feeling them even when, you know, and then you get, you got to feel them. That's the truth. And, uh, feelings, it could be physical sensations. It could be t changes in time or temperature or routine. You could have something coming up, a big project, a test. An event, travel, guests, whatever it is that's keeping you awake, uh, I'm here to keep you company and take your mind off of it. 
and to let you know you're not alone, to let you know you're not alone uh, and, and that uh, a lot of other people can relate to what you're going through. Not everybody, there's a lot of people listening right now, right? And I can, I think that I could say that there's probably someone out there, and it might even be me, that can relate to how you're feeling right now and say, yeah, it doesn't feel good. Not, now, I might not know or have experienced exactly what you're going through, but the reason I make the show is because, uh, you know, all those things. Like lately, past few nights, I've had to get up every three hours with an alarm to, t- to help somebody with something. And, you know, that has not it, actually my sleep has been better than I would have thought because it's spread it out over 11 hours. But uh, those times between alarms, like uh, they haven't been super restful. But whatever it is, that's keeping you awake. Uh, there's somebody out there that can relate to how it feels. And the other thing is you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a bedtime you can at least feel neutral about, if not look forward to a bedtime you don't dread. Because if it's been anything like my experience throughout my entire life, uh, that's what can happen. And even dread sometimes doesn't even sum it up because there's a lot of other feelings that could be there too. Uh, But you deserve a place you could rest and get the sleep you need to make your life more manageable so you could flourish. So your life can be better. You deserve that. You really do. So those are the most important things. Now, this show, it does take a few tries to get used to. I'll try to explain why coming up here. But uh, if you already loathe the show, it doesn't change those other facts that a lot of us can relate to how you feel. Even a lot of people can relate to not liking the show at first. I want to say, I probably heard it, I'm not even exaggerating, over a million times. Hey, I didn't like the show at first. It took me a few tries to get used to it. I've heard that in a lot of different ways. Or even... I felt very strong dislike to you in the show. And then a few years later, I came back. Now I pay to support the podcast. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to like it if you give it a few tries. It just means that that's a normal experience. But if you already know, there's something about you. I just, uh, it's not going to work. For, it's not going to work out. Sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you has a list of other stuff because it doesn't change the fact you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a place you could rest. And one of us listening right now can probably relate to how you're feeling and say, yeah, I I hope you find something that works for you. So all that said, what goes on with this show? First, what I do is I send my voice across the deep, dark night. Then I use lulling, soothing, creaky, dulcet tones, which mean my my voice is not traditionally soothing. I go off topic. I get mixed up. Uh, You know, I I, like my voice is... uh, it's not traditionally soothing. It's more distracting, and you say, oh, this is a voice they could barely listen to. And some people say that at first, like, in, they mean one thing, but regular listeners are nodding in their heads. They're like, yes, yeah, Scoots has a voice I could barely listen to. I just barely need to listen to it. I mean, some people said I'm barely listenable, or, and, and I mean, that's true, too. Uh, but uh, lulling, soothing t- tones, pointless meanders, and superfluous tangents. So I'm going to go off topic. I'm going to get mixed up. I'm going to repeat myself. I'm going to wonder, and then I'll wah wah wonder why. And then I'll follow another thought as it runs away. And then I'll k- cradle that thought. Then I'll then I'll say, say cradles. Uh, what was up with that cradle? It was t- wasn't that a bedtime story? Who puts a cradle in a tree? I'm just one, you know, other than birds. I mean, I, I'm not kidding. I just thought of that now. Like, wouldn't you think, because anybody that's told a story to a child between the ages of two and 40, it, they they always have questions, right? Uh, that's a good thing about making this podcast. You could ask all the questions you want, uh, and, and it's, it's it works for both of us. But you say, like, wouldn't you have thought back... In Toyland, that's where I'm thinking maybe the story was first told, in my imagination at least. And wouldn't you think four or five of the kids would say, what in the heck? I mean, they might not use a word like heck. They'd say, what in a, I don't know, what in oblivion? Why was a cradle in a tree? And then another kid would what kind of tree was it? Was it in a tree, was a cradle in a treehouse in a tree? 
and they'd say, okay, well, the parent was just really tired, and they said, the tree's rocking, and then maybe I don't have to rock the baby. And the kids would say, okay. And, but, okay, one more thing, you know. They say, how does the kid cradle, like, uh, I don't know. I was just thinking of that. Not to, not to, you know, it all ends out great. Don't worry. Uh, like, it's just an imaginary story anyway. But in the Babes in Toyland movie, I know that I, I remember that being in there. But it only took me whatever, how many years since I was exposed to all that stuff to realize, what the heck were you thinking there? Like, uh, I mean, I, I can't, I say, I can't, I get the, like, the rocking idea. Um, but maybe the, maybe that one kid was right. It's in a tree house. It's like a metaphor. It's uh, you don't realize, oh, it's in a tree house or tree home. Is a tree house a tree home or is a tree home sometimes a tree house? Those are questions. Uh, here's a question. These are superfluous tangents that just keep coming up. When you, so there was one time as a lot of kids had tree house fantasies, not like that, uh, just a fantasy of having my own treehouse. And then at one point, I think I was by myself, but I might have been with one of my best friends uh, at the time. We discovered a treehouse. And I think it was a treehouse, you know, the kid, it was uh, it was far in the backyard of a house. So I don't think you could see it from the house. Eventually we got, you know, but we uh, we found our way into someone else's treehouse. Can you make someone else's treehouse a home? I mean, I, like, uh, I guess temporarily. I think what they did was they kept trying to remove the um, things you used to climb up, whatever, the ladder. That was their secret. Uh, so I don't know whatever happened to that. Uh, uh, I feel like probably we got told we couldn't go there. Oh, I'm making a sleep podcast? Sorry, those, those are pointless. I'm not even kidding. Those were unplanned. I mean, just like our unplanned discovery of the treehouse. But if you're new, let me give you some more information. Uh, or if you're a regular listener, you know, this is always good to know what to expect. I told you why I make the show. This is a podcast you don't listen to. You can listen. And if you need to listen, I'll be here to the very end. But there's no pressure to listen or pay attention. It, uh, this is a show some people turn me way down to a mumble. And some people kind of listen, some people just barely listen, but it's like, if you're waiting for it to start and, and me to get to the point, the point is for me to meander around and eventually, you know, this sleep with me, I'm slowly going nowhere. Don't worry. We'll get nowhere soon. We're up. Oh, we're already there kind of thing, but really we're going somewhere because there are people that can't sleep. So they know, oh, Scoots is kind of, gen he's going somewhere. It just takes forever, and it's about the journey, but you can only have a journey if there's a destination. So I'm just saying that because there's a small percentage of listeners that are listening to listen because they can't sleep at all, and, but they already know that. But if you're a new listener that can't sleep, don't worry. We'll get to the end of something here. It'll be a little bit of an adventure uh, crossover podcast. But uh, it'll be fun, and uh, all will be well, as Emma Otter says. So this is a show you don't really listen to. Also, believe it or not, it doesn't put you to sleep. I keep you company while you fall asleep. So no pressure to listen, no pressure to fall asleep. I'll be here for about an hour, and what will happen if you're reg as you become a regular listener, you'll just, you'll just fall asleep at some point. Uh, now, some people set sleep timers. Some people listen to 10 episodes a night. Some people listen to an episode in, in five parts over the week. So you'll see, kind of see how it goes for you. But ideally, you do, you're listening to me and you're like, uh-huh, you're barely making sense. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, oh, I'm awake. It's uh, time to get up. So see how it goes. But I'm more here to keep you company. I'm to be your boar bay, your boar sib, sib, your boar bud, your boar bestie, your boar burr, your neighbor, your boar bra, your boar friend. Your boy friend in the deep dark night to keep you company and take your mind off stuff. I'm on call almost. So those are a couple of things to know. The other things to know is uh, structure of the show that throws people off more than anything else. And this the show has an intentional structure that you could adjust if you become a regular listener, or you could adjust it right away. But I, I say, well, kind of wait and see how it goes. 
So show starts off with a greeting, friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, so you feel seen and welcome. Then there's support for the show or sponsors and, and uh, listener support so the show can be free and come out reliably twice a week with a large uh, archive of free episodes for you to choose from. Then there's support for listeners. Then there's support for the other stuff, like communities around the show and stuff like that. So that's the support stuff. Uh, then there's an intro, which is separate from the support. It's a show within a show. We've already gone far afield. I never thought we'd be talking about tree houses and, uh, you know, visiting toy, the toy land in my mind, uh, though I love visiting there and questioning parenting practices in toy land. I mean, who am I? How presumptuous of I? It'd say, where would be the first place? Uh, like you could, if you, if you're running some sort of like uh, educational program, you could send people into those places in my mind to run, be like, yeah, we'd like to go there and, uh, just do some surveys so, uh, oh, so the intro, the reason it goes on and on and on is, uh, like if you're a regular listener, it's something familiar every time, but the, the intros are different every time too. It follows a familiar structure, but new stuff every time because the intro is part of people's wind down. Now there is a percentage of people that skip it or are falling asleep but for most listeners, it's part of a bedtime routine, whether you're getting ready for bed or you're in bed getting comfortable or you're doing some other uh, chill activity like doodling. Don't listen while you're canoodling, please. Uh, listen with a pool noodle. Like, I mean, I foam roll. You could lay down with a pool noodle, I mean, on, a, on the floor and, uh, I don't know, talk to it. Uh, how come there's not pool noodles with faces? Like I would, I could picture a giraffe or a worm, you know, a nice neon one. Well, there you go. Some store can take that idea for free. Uh, be sure not to credit me or send me anything, but uh, our pool noodles have faces. Um, well, what was my point? Oh, the intro goes on and on and on to ease you into bedtime, to give you a buffer between the day and the, and falling asleep. So that's why the intros are 10 to 20 minutes long, and it does take some getting used to, uh, but just see how it goes. Uh, so there's the intro. Then tonight it'll be a crossover episode that I talked about at the Sleepy Supporter Zone. It'll be a reimagining. So it'll be a nice little fun story about a giant friendly fish uh, and uh, uh, Professor Atwood, and, and it's going to be great. Uh, so there's that. That's the story. Oh, so there's intro, support, like sponsor support, then the story, then the thank yous at the end. And that's it. That's how I make this show. That's why I make the show. That's what to expect. Give it a few tries. See how it goes. I work really hard. I yearn and I strive. I really want to help you fall asleep. Thanks again for coming by. And here's a couple of ways I'm able to do it for you for free twice a week. Sleep With Me is brought to you by Progressive. Have you tried the Name Your Price tool yet? It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to find a rate that works for you. It's just one of the many ways you could save with Progressive. Get your quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. All right, everybody. So this is episode 37 from The Quiet Journeys of Professor Atwood. I probably talked about it earlier, but you could always find this in your podcast app of choice uh, or at whitecatentertainment.com. Let Professor Atwood take you on a journey and help you fall asleep. Each quiet journey is designed with a soundscape and a bedtime story to help you learn something before you go to sleep. And that comes with uh, monthly updates. Uh, it comes out once a month. This is episode 37, kind of a reimagining of it. Uh, the friendly, f big friendly fish in the Panama Canal. Uh, hello, adventurers. I uh, hope you're doing well and getting nice and comfortable. This evening, I'm going to tell you about my encounter with a giant friendly fish at the Panama Canal. It was turning out to be quite an adventure, 
as you know, I was taking my ship, the Recovery, and my crew through the Panama Canal. Following a treasure map, my friend and professional washboard player, Benny, sent me. And, uh, do, do, you know, do, like, uh, you know, you may have heard other, you know, I'm not sure, was it Benny? My mind escapes me right now that I met in Alaska. But I know that uh, people that listen to multiple episodes of Professor Atwood uh, during the day for breaks will let me know. Uh, we were headed to Gardner Island, just off of New York. Uh, the interesting thing was that there was a section of the island on the treasure map, uh, but not an actual map of the island. And that la- landmass discrepancy, that was, it, that was a GNR album that never came out. It was supposed to come out after a spaghetti incident. Landmass discrepancy would have been a good one. Would, would be where we would begin our search for the mysterious treasure of Captain Kidd, with two Ds, remember. Now, things didn't go according to plan, and I can't say it was the first time. Honestly, plans when you're adventuring are more like guidelines. You know where you're going, but you always have to roll with the old, you know, roll with the ship, as they say, roll with the waves. or it may have been Steve Winwood who once said wisely, roll with it, baby, or just roll with it. But it might not have been Steve Winwood. And many of you may say, Steve Winwood, not familiar, which you say, okay, well, roll with it. Uh, Steve Winwood may need to roll with it then. There was that time uh, Professor Tansky and I uh, decided to take a vacation together in China, and that's when we found that there was a second Great Wall built just under the first. That was a time that unexpectedly Professor Tansky, uh, they said they were running. They were trying to catch a balloon shaped like a puppy poo, and they 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 ch- this balloon was caught in a downdraft, uh, not a, it was not a helium balloon, but it's a point of order, I guess. It was caught in a, uh, a downdraft where they went down a friendly-looking tunnel, so well lit, uh, and that did lead to the discovery of the second wall. And I also had to remind Professor Tansky, you know, the, the, like... Uh, Maybe walk next time, or let us know. By the way, I'm I'm fo- maybe don't chase every balloon you see. Anyway, it was f- smooth sailing on the Pacific Ocean as we were on our way, following the course Colin, our navigator, had charted, and things began to get complicated when we arrived at the Panama Canal. Now you might be surprised to hear this, but we uh, were waiting our turn. We got the VIP Canal Lane. Uh, because uh, Professor Perez from the Panama Canal Authority Special Projects Division radioed us. I was definitely a bit concerned, as while their name is the Panama Canal Projects, Panama Canal Authority Special Projects Division, I knew that that was an interesting a ruse, an interesting use of language, uh, because projects actually made it was uh, Panama Panama Canal Authority Special Challenges and Growth Opportunities Division, Unexp- usually unexpected and unplanned uh, challenges and so growth opportunities uh, division. And what a challenge and growth opportunity they had! A uh, a big, friendly fish uh, was going right down the middle, middle of the Panama Canal smi- with this, a giant smile, a smile so wide uh, that it was incredibly distracting. And I admit, it, like, uh, this growth opportunity and challenge seemed a bit out of my wheelhouse, uh, but sometimes it's good to get outside of your comfort zone and say, well, let me help with this challenge uh, involving a giant friendly fish. 
So anyway, back to what was the story. I, I had Captain Flynn bring us through the Panama, bring us uh, through the initial canal locks and into the center of the Panama Canal. Professor Perez looked on nervously as we entered the center of uh, the man-made Gatun, of the man-made Gatun Lake between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and then we saw it. What could only be described, like my crew, first they were gasping, then some were giggling, some were uh, chuckling. So many noises my crew was making. Is this giant, again, you know, the title of the story is Giant Friendly Fish, uh, and wish to, when a fish is smiling in a non-metaphorical way, an actual smile that you could feel on the inside. You assume they're a friendly fish, uh, the, and they're giant. Uh, and it was swimming around our ship, uh, but other than smiling and occasionally making eye contact with someone, uh, it, it seemed like it was mostly ignoring us. It was just swimming around the perimeter of the engineered lake uh, between the locks. Uh, now, water was not very deep, and we were pretty close, so we had a pretty good view of it swimming around. And it was big. I mean, we're talking 80 feet uh, long, uh, uh, fin to fin to nose or whatever, fin to smile to rear, cheek to cheek. There's, I don't know, like, a, but uh, it, it did, uh, it did, there was something else, though, because it just seemed to sit, s swim in a circle over and over again. Now, Professor Perez radioed the uh, Panama Canal, you know, growth opportunity team and had them open the locks leading back to the Pacific Ocean because that is where uh, this big friendly fish had come from. And as soon as they were opened, you know, th this friendly giant friendly fish, giant friendly fish, GFF, uh, could you have a GFF for a BFF? If you're a fish, for sure. If you're a giant fish, uh, yeah, or we'll find out, right? Would you be my BFF, GFF? We're not there yet. But anyway, it, um, as soon as the, the locks were open, you know, the giant friendly fish could have exited at any time. But it did something curious. It examined the opening for a moment, and then it ignored it and kept on swimming around the perimeter as if it knew... Uh, the open locks would lead it back to the Pacific Ocean, but it chose not to go. Very curious indeed. Professor Perez shrugged, shrugged, shrugged her shoulders and ordered the locks closed again. Now, the crew had lots of questions, and obviously Dolores, who was in charge of uh, ship, SSO, ship, ship safety officer, ship, ship shape and ship safety officer, once again asked about, uh, are we 100% sure just because we feel like the, the, the smile and the eye contact of this giant fish uh, and a sense of friendliness, uh, are we sure this fish is friendly? And I said with confidence, I'm not sure, but I feel good. Uh, and that led us to our main problem. Okay, the fish was swimming around, ignoring us, ignoring way back to the sea. And uh, even when we tried, like, uh, uh, to show it, uh, hey, this, like, we tried to show our ship, like, we went and started, well, anyway, I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, it didn't seem to want to follow us uh, or even acknowledge, other than occasionally with eye contact only, that we were even there. We didn't know what to do. And I had to think for a moment. This wasn't an easy one to puzzle out. Uh, it wasn't like that time long ago when I was in that temple in the Amazon and uh, I fell asleep and then I woke up and I wasn't sure where I was. I mean, sometimes that happens, you know, uh, just like in the movies, you know, you step on something or you take a, some something gold off a pedestal and normally then you got to, you know, move fast uh, or, uh, wherever, you, you know, if you're in a hurry. Now, uh, that, w that one time that happened when uh, a, a scholar from my team interpreted some pictographs incorrectly and took uh, 
mistook uh, uh, lots of good stuff for impending trouble and growth opportunity challenges, but in an immediate way. And then they kind of got nervous, obviously, because they had a strong reaction to thinking, oh, this is, I don't know if I want this immediate growth opportunity. So thankfully, while they were uh, caught up in that, uh, and this was a time I assessed my team building, uh, pre, pre, uh, adventure team building strategies. Uh, but I, what I did was I found a rotating wheel uh, with ancient symbols and I just had to rotate those and then a hidden door opened and we were off. Uh, now this was a bit more complicated than just figuring something out like that, like a, a clear problem to be solved. We had uh, something we didn't understand. Uh, things were kind of in a closed circuit, so to speak, with the giant, uh, with the big friendly fish in its own electrical loop, ignoring everything else. And there was only one way to approach this problem: the giant friendly fish continued to swim and swim and swim and swim and swim and swim and swim, swimming, swimming, swimming. And I realized, that, okay, uh, first I got caught, I said swim, swimming, swam. It, it had swam earlier, then now it's swimming. It's on a swim. And, uh, okay, I said, well, I have to communicate with this giant friendly fish uh, if I want to get it. Now, you see, what's the problem? This was a giant fish, and uh, people said like, uh, oh, you, cause, uh, other ships are passing through, through one, no one wants to bump a friendly fish Two, the fish could take, did take up a lot of space. And, uh, three, everyone that saw this friendly fish, that wasn't on a specific, uh, task like we were, they mostly would be consumed with laughter and joy and then they would just want to watch the fish. So that has was was what happened before we arrived, before our story even started. Okay, so I had to get get in touch with this giant friendly fish, and uh, that's not you know easier said than done, because you know you know uh, I have experience with some land animals uh, speak the universal pantomime language, old UPL. But sh- 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 sure, you know, sea creatures, they, they, they're they different. Uh, it might be a different situation. You know, I've spoken to uh, seahorses and emperor penguins, uh, but a giant friendly fish? Um, I don't know. Well, unfortunately, there was only one thing for it. I hesitated because if I'm being honest, I knew... That I was opening a can of worms uh, if I went down this path I was thinking of, uh, but I didn't see any alternative. And Bradley and the crew, they didn't have any other ideas and were looking to me to lead to a solution. Yeah, that's pressure, sure. Uh, but, you know, you don't become a scientist or an adventurer if you're not looking. I mean, sometimes you do. Uh, if you're not looking for challenging growth opportunities or helping other people with them. I mean, you could become a scientist or an adventurer if you're not looking, you know, but then you'd, you'd find your adventure, you know, maybe through grant writing or something else. Uh, but me, I'm a field, I look at the field work. Uh, and even when it gets challenging or what I may define as uncomfortable or unpleasant, but I also knew I would need help, and a specific kind of help uh, that uh, there was also a time element uh, because, you know, no ships were passing through, cargo ships were backing up, uh, and people were getting steamy, you know, and call, making calls and saying, why, why am I waiting? And then people waiting for their, uh, what are those things that the Jetsons worked on, cogs and... Uh, widgets uh you know cogs cog you know people were waiting for for things uh, to to go through both sides of the panama canal especially ship captains uh and the, the there's no answer they said at least give us a time frame or an answer but the panama canal authority was not able to do this uh 
And they said, yeah, we'll, 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 uh, you know, we'll give you some extra uh, frequent uh, passing through the canal points on your next trip. But that was not cutting it either. So I sighed, and I think uh, Bradley suspected what I was thinking. I had to contact Professor Ryland, and I didn't relish the idea of contacting Professor Ryland, as I had no, but, you know, there's no choice uh, that I could think of other than that. Now, I may have forgot to mention this, or, or maybe I did, or maybe another time when we were talking, but Professor Ryland was uh, into studying the intelligence and uh, inner workings of the mind of giant fish. And they had attempted to create a, a, like a different, like an electrocephalographic helmet uh, to put on uh, fish to further get a view of the inner workings of their mind. And this was a difficult process. In the past, it did not go well. It took two submarines, uh, three boats, and my own ship to help them sort it out. Because, you, 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 like, the one, uh, you know, like, how do you get a fish to stop swimming? Two, do they know, hey, this is for the benefit of all fish. It's just going to put, you're not going to feel anything. Three, you also have the currents of the ocean, which tends to tangle things up. That is the main issue, tangled lines. Uh, They're supposed to be transmitting in, 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 information. And Professor Ryland was very disappointed and set their sights lower, uh, or not lower, but in a different direction. They found a cooperative dolphin, not giant, though. Also, you see, technically, that's a mammal, I believe. But that was published in numerous journals. Uh, but to this day, they say, oh, that, uh, you know, that was a big miss, uh, not being able to get giant fish to wear an electronic brainwave helmets. Now, for some reason, they took this very personally, or very personally, because we did it, we had, you know, we talked about the feelings by using strawberry shortcake dolls, because sometimes it's easier to do that, talk through dolls. Uh, and I had said, uh, Professor Ryland, how are you feeling? Uh, uh, I'm, you know whatever, Tommy Blueberry, your strawberry shortcake. And I said, very disappointed. That's how I knew they were very disappointed. Strawberry shortcake, uh, because in that case, uh, what they had, we, we had found a giant, uh, that we, you know, I had to create a whole story about that, where there was a giant strawberry and uh, a giant strawberry bush and, uh, you know, uh, Strawberry Shortcake wanted to talk to the giant strawberry. Same, similar idea. And she got a horn. Oh, because it was across a giant, uh, ab like, uh, abyss. Uh, and so she used the horn to, to, to amplify her mouth or noises to talk to the giant strawberry and strawberry bush that was not accessible but there was no response, so that's why Strawberry Shortcake was very disappointed. Okay, so e, there's a, like, a, the, go back to the technology. It's like recording, like, electrical activity, uh, and that represents uh, the activity, like, beneath the surface of the, the head of the fish. And, you know, you're, you're typically using sensors to, to do that, uh, but... Uh, uh, like it just it says, oh, this is fluctuating or this is fluctuating. Ionic current, currents, neurons, no, no currents. Uh, though I could go with a salad with some currents right now. Uh, it's recording spontaneous electrical activity over a period of time, and uh, you know you could either focus on event-related potentials or uh, contents. Uh, you know, professional fluctuations in time locked to an event, uh, like a stimulus onset or button press, or uh, neural oscillations, uh, or brain waves, they call them, uh, some do. And uh, you could see those and observe them in frequency domain. Because, you know, there's billions of neurons uh, that are electrical, not to go on a ta scientific tangent, but... Uh, 
These are uh, electrically charged, polarized, if you will. There's also uh, proteins pumping ions uh, across things. Neurons are exchanging ions uh, with extracellular, with other things. Uh, some help uh, maintain resting potential. Others propagate action potentials. And you may be familiar with magnetic, uh, but also ions of similar charge repel each other, <laughs> just like uh, interpersonally with me, myself and some scientists and scholars. And when many ions are pushed out of many neurons at the same time, that also impacts their neighbors, and then that impacts their neighbors' neighbors, and so on. That creates a wave. This is known as volume conduction. And when a wave of ions uh, reaches the sensors, uh, uh, they the sensors uh, the, the have electrons in them which are pushed or pulled, uh, and uh, that happens easily. Uh, and the push or pull of voltages between any two electrodes uh, it can be measured by a voltometer. And recording these voltages over time, that is what we're going on. Electric potential generated by an individual neuron is far too small by individual one to be picked up. Uh, so it always it reflects the summation of synchronous activity of thousands or millions of neurons of a similar spatial orientation. But as you can see, you got to be lined up. So if it doesn't have a similar spatial orientation, their ions do not line up and create waves uh, to, and don't create waves to be detected. You know, there's pyramidal neurons uh, that uh, because that are lined up in a pyramid structure, those are well aligned and work together uh, or, or fire together uh, or activate together. Because of voltage field gradients fall off with the square of distance, though, activity from deep sources is more difficult to detect than the currents near the skull. There could also be oscillations at a variety of frequencies. Several of these oscillations have uh, characteristic frequency ranges. Spatial distributions are associated with different states of functioning, you know, waking, sleeping, these oscillations represent synchronized activity over a network of neurons. Uh, the neuronal networks underlying some of these oscillations are understood. Uh, thalamore cortical uh, resonance. That reminds me of thalamores, uh, I believe. Uh, back when I used to uh, uh, adventure uh, as a... Uh, what was, what was I... Uh, uh, but that was an adventure I used to have, uh, still may have, I, you know, 10 years old, I still play it when I need a little oblivion. Uh, anyway, not that kind of oblivion, just an adventure, uh, with my scrolls of elders. Uh, okay. Where was I though? Oh, you got, uh, oscillations, uh, Theramortical resonance, uh, sleep spindles, uh, posterior basic rhythm and dreams about having, uh, you know, that's uh, where it all comes from, maybe. And research that measures this stuff with spiking of neurons and the relationship between the two is complex. Uh, there's gamma bands and phase, delta bands, uh, neuron, you know, that measure the neuron spikes. And uh, sometimes you use a gel or a paste, uh, and uh, you want to reduce impedance. Uh, so you may even try to clean everything off uh, so you get a good signal. Uh, and again, that's where the wires come in, which is what gets tangled in the ocean due to the waves. Uh, there are systems that use caps or nets where the sensors are embedded, uh, and this is kind of common with uh, high density arrays, uh, but in the ocean, this had to be different. Uh, and of course, every not all sea creatures are the same. So Professor Ly Ryland tried to create a custom helmet with netting that was waterproof and comfortable for a dolphin and wireless. Now, regardless of the type of mammal that uh, the, who, that wears the helmet, uh, 
The signals can be stored electronically, filtered for display. You may even use a high-pass filter to filter out slow artifacts like electro-galvanic signals, movement artifacts. Uh, this is like uh, recording stuff. And the low-pass filter, which uh, filters out high-frequency art high frequency artifacts like uh, electromyographic signals. You could also use a notch filter. Now, something else we didn't have to worry about uh, uh, was we were in the middle of an engineered canal. Now, so I needed to tie this all together because there was researchers in uh, University of California, Irvine, that had developed uh, processing techniques to identify correlations of imagined speech and intended direction. Uh, they could be broadcast uh, via, like, uh, just by uh, by signals, uh, like very similar to signals such as spoken words, uh, and systems for decoding imagined speech. Uh, uh, these are like a brain to computer interfaces. So that's why I needed Professor Ryland. Uh, and their dolphin, and this new technology, uh, with all these elements working in tandem, I believe we could communicate with the giant friendly fish if you followed everything I said. Now, if you did not, uh, you did not. Uh, but we know what could we do. So I explained the plan to the crew a brief, in a briefer way, uh, but they listened to this recording too. But they still looked at me blankly, except for Bradley, of course, because uh, he knew Professor Ryland. And despite the possible obstacles, uh, Bradley was like, this might just work. Uh, everyone then got to work with their assignments because there's lots of preparation. Now, I first uh, got a hold of Professor Ryland uh, out in the ocean. And Professor Ryland was in the Pacific uh, Ocean just outside of Hawaii. We started talking about the helmet uh, and what went wrong putting on a giant fish. And as uh, like uh, as familiar with our communications, I thought uh, 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 said, "Let me tell you about a relatable situation I'm in right now." But Professor Ryland seemed melancholy about this. Uh, I said, "Oh, wait a second! This is another giant friendly fish. I don't think it's going to work." Uh, and the whole ocean is going to uh, mock me. Now, the dolphin that Professor Ryland worked with, Phil, was with him, uh, nudged him on the side of his boat. Uh, that cheered him up. It looks like uh, Ryland and Phil are, uh, developed a brain a connection through brainwave helmets. So that was a positive sign. And Professor Ryland uh, thumbed up, we'll help uh, but it'll take some time for us to get here, probably a week. And I said, that's too long. But I had another idea uh, to get them there quicker. Uh, so my next call was to uh, Gully. Uh, and we go way back on adventures and unexpected uh, problem-solving opportunities. Uh, so they owed me a favor. Uh, and they worked with the researchers at UC Irvine. I said, we're going to need that equipment. We're also going to need it waterproof, and we're going to need it uh, ASAP. I also need you to use some sort of high-speed tr travel and pick up uh, Professor Ryland and the dolphin, uh, Phil. And they hesitated uh, because they knew that Pro Professor Ryland liked to vent on travel trips uh, and that they would have to hear that. And I said, well, but you, you know, you said it, call you anytime. So they got a high speed helicopter and they said, we consider it done. They even got a water tank on the helicopter for Phil. And they said, how did you know about all this? Uh, and I said, I don't remember. It's just, in, you know, uh, maybe my son, the astronaut mentioned it. Uh, or Wikipedia, who knows? Uh, okay, so everything, that was all I could do in the media thing, but everything was in motion. And then Beverly, our chef, uh, set out a lovely table for the crew, uh, Ropa Vieja, which uh, is uh, delicious. Uh, 
It's uh, shredded beef simmered in uh, tomato, garlic, onion, cumin, and oregano, and served with uh, rice and fried plantains. And, you know, the person that makes uh, sleep with me, would you believe it, uh, they love Ropa Vieja, and they used to make it, uh, but it turns out the people they used to make it for did not enjoy it. And so in an ultimate irony, uh, they, do, like, uh, they don't make it anymore. But uh, Beverly also set an extra place for uh, Professor Perez, who could st- who was staying with us on the ship uh, until this uh, f- giant friendly fish matter was resolved. And Dolores, uh, you know the uh, ship ship sh- ship uh, ship shape, uh, sa- you know ship safety officer, said, "I want to keep an eye on the behavior of the giant friendly fish, which was still swimming in circles." And ignoring us. And then it was next morning that Gully arrived in the helicopter with Ryland and Phil. And that was quicker than I expected. This, uh, Gully said they made some uplifts uh, or uh, upgrades to the helicopter. But it wasn't time for discussing that. Uh, now, Gully was uh, very affable. And it took a lot to surprise them. Uh, but seeing a giant uh, friendly fish swimming around uh, the Panama Canal... Did the trick. Uh, Professor Ryland, Gully, and Phil were all uh, slack jawed, then laughing, then elbowing one another at what they saw. I mean, when you're seeing a giant friendly fish swimming around and around and around, uh, it gets your attention in a good way. But they also had helicoptered in, so they saw the impact of the backups. Now that everyone was here, I explained my plan. Professor Ryland would modify uh, Phil's helmet, uh, and then they would use the research uh, communication speech processor. Then Phil would use this uh, marine, their marine brainwave power to communicate with the giant friendly fish and figure out what's up. So essentially, Phil the dolphin was acting as a wordless translator for human to fish, to dolphin to fish communication. So we started putting the plan in action. We had 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 a good night's sleep the night before. So we put on a helmet on Phil, then upgraded the firmware and the software of uh, remote uh, receivers, powered those up. then uh, we we also at the same time were getting Phil adjusted to the, you know the water easing Phil into the water of the Panama Canal through a series of pumps and stuff like that, uh, and eventually Phil was fully in the Panama Canal and started swimming around uh, in the general direction of the, uh, and Phil had adjusted at this point to the fact that the fish was smiling. And you might say at this point, like, what's the difference between a fish that looks like it's smiling, but it's just its natural structure? And, uh, and it would say, well, I don't want to reveal the actual, you know, I said to the, the, the species of fish, uh, their representative said, please don't share what species this giant fish is because it's going to confuse people. And then they'll, when they look for us, they'll look for a smiling fish. No, this specific fish was smiling. It wasn't the natural state of the fish. Okay, so Phil was swimming towards the giant friendly fish. But again, the fish was ignoring uh, everybody except for eye contact. Uh, and so looking at the dolphin and looking at us, and you say, how do you know? And I say, well, that was an interesting thing, th- that uh, this fish uh, would come partially out of the water. Yes, you're correct. Uh, now, that was not unique to this friendly fish, uh, but it was a type of fish that could uh, break the surface, uh, basically hold the breath uh, when they're out of water. Uh, because uh, just to back up, like it, it would feed on surface plankton, or surface something. I'm not sure if it's plankton, to be honest with you. But so that's part of its natural state of things. Maybe just uh, kelp or something. So it would go up uh, 
and it could swim and, and eat or look for something to eat uh, so its eyes and its mouth would be above the water. And then uh, the, the fish uh, kind of stopped swimming in circles and went towards Phil, and they seemed to pause uh, and just swim together. At first, it was surprised, but then they started, it seemed like they were communicating. And everyone started cheering. And then we were, we were on a delay, though. So the content was being relayed to Ryland at the receiver, translated and sent to us. And we knew that this also, you know, the game of telephone that children would play... Uh, that this would probably not be 100% accurate, uh, but we would be able to get a, a general idea of what they were talking about. And we were able to get an idea of why the giant friendly fish was swimming around and around in circles where they were. And part of what stuck out is that Professor Ryland paused, uh, unsure if this was correct translation. And Ryland said, Phil, do, let me just, uh, can we rephrase this? Can I rephrase it to you? Can you rephrase it to the fish? Can You know, a lot of rephrasing, reflective, active listening type stuff uh, to verify things. Because also the funny thing is uh, dolphins can, are a bit of a trickster sometimes. So it turned out uh, the fish's name was Cecil. And Cecil was in, like, in a swimming contest, of all things. Uh, and we had no idea about this. Uh, and again, we have not been able to verify this, except, if, uh, so none of this may be true, but, you know, it is true. Also, when we spoke to the representatives of this species of fish, they said, we don't, we, we don't communicate with humans, one. And two, we don't we don't have uh, swimming races or swimming co competitions. But according to Cecil, they were on a competition. They're going from Hawaii to Cuba. And this is where it gets really interesting. Was that uh, Cecil found out had found out like Cecil like because Cecil is uh, friendly and likes to make eye contact with all beings. Uh, but sometimes humans, uh, Cecil had get, lo, slowly learned about the, the Panama Canal from running across other ships. Because a lot of times they say, we got to go through the Panama Canal to get to the land, like, uh, the, like in the gap of like a friendly fish not speaking to you, but smiling and making eye contact with you. After thousands and thousands of contacts, naturally a large number of those contacts want to fill that air with something like a conversation. So Cecil said, wait a second, I can win the, like the swimming competition by using the Panama Canal. And this was, according to Cecil, a tradition among uh, the school of fish they hung with uh, annually. All fish uh, of, of, of this species of a certain uh, generation swim from Pacific to Atlantic. They go all the way around South America, and they end up in the general region of Cuba. But Cecil, knowing about the Panama Canal, said, I'm going to use the Panama Canal. And this is why Cecil refused to use the lock that returned to the Pacific, because then they would have, uh, they'd be in last place. Now, I don't want to weigh in on right or, you know, wrong about this move, uh, a part of an ocean marathon, but we did have to figure out what we needed to do because Cecil said, I need to use the canal at this point because I want to at least, like, come get to, now that I've been delayed, I still could get there first, but even if I don't. But we said, well, I don't know if that's fair, uh, what about the other fish? Uh, and then it started a whole debate, even in our heads. Uh, but there's something about Cecil. We said, oh, you're smiling. Are you smiling? And Cecil goes, no, I smile like this. I love life, man. So, yeah, I'm laughing either way. Even if you force me to come in last, I'll still smile. But, uh, you know, that's what we're like. Uh, so there's a, just a big debate about whose business is this, uh, what about all the uh, all the other uh, ships in the canal? And then also, sensibly, if we allow this now, what about all the other fish? Uh, 
giant fish friendly or not. Uh, if we let one friendly fish through a canal and they talk about it or any other, these other giant fish hear about the canal, it'll disrupt canal traffic. And so it was like, okay. And they said, we said, how many marathons and what about other fish that have marathons? Uh, the thing was the debate went on so long and all the things went on so long, you know, because of satellites, uh, we checked things, uh, and we also did calculations, you know, about, uh, speed of, uh, giant fish of this size, uh, when it started. And we said, well, you've been in the canal so long that if we send you towards the Atlantic, uh, you'll be behind, uh. And we wanted to make sure, uh, can we get this information to Cecil so Cecil understands? Uh, and Cecil did understand things and said, hey, can we just keep this to ourselves? Don't tell any other giant fish about this then. I won't tell anybody about the existence of this canal. And if they, But if they bring it up, I'll say, oh, no, no, we're not allowed in there. And I could even explain to them that fact uh, when I come in last. Uh, and uh, we said, okay, we won't tell anybody that you tried to, you know, fudge the rules on your marathon. And even Phil said, don't worry about it. And so then we said, okay, we got to get everything ready. Uh, Phil got back in Phil's tank and got in the helicopter. And we called for the lock to open. And... Uh, Cecil said, okay, well, I'll try to catch up. Either way, I'm still ha I'm happy this happened. Uh, what, a, what a growth opportunity. Uh, and I never, you know, now I know how to talk to, you know, I know I got to talk to Phil and through Phil, all of you. And Professor Ryland, of course, was blown away because this was their dream. What, an op what a growth opportunity for Professor Ryland, Ryland communicating with a giant friendly fish. They had done it in some sense uh, and felt, well, well, I'm vindicated. It was just that there had to be a wireless transmitter. And they said, I look forward to seeing you at the next mixer. And I said, thanks for your help and Phil. And we're so glad that uh, this uh, gave, you know, this was a growth opportunity for so many. I thanked Gully, said, now we're even. Gully said, I don't keep score. Call me when you need me. I'll drop for Rylan and Phil off. Uh, so the canal was clear at this point, and Prof Professor Perez asked us if there was anything you could do to um, repay us for our help in solving this growth opportunity challenge. And I said, actually, we need a helicopter. Uh, ours, ours is being fixed uh, and we have a helipad on our ship without a helicopter. It just doesn't, it throws everything off. Uh, plus, we like to have it, you know, to scout stuff and get stuff done, pick up snacks. So they said, no problem, we'll loan you a helicopter. So then the lock opened for us, and we were on our way into the Atlantic towards Gardner Island, Gardner Island, uh, and it seemed like a smooth sailing. Uh, and I could tell you about that in another time. Uh, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about, you know, growth opportunities uh, before we close. Uh, you know, sometimes we consider ourselves stuck. Uh, but if we look at it in another way, it's not that you're stuck. Uh, it's that this is a problem solving or growth opportunity that you feel stuck about. Uh, so your job really isn't just to, that to be stuck, it's to help unstick things uh, so the problem can move on, just like we did with Cecil. Maybe having a little detachment from, you know, the things to say, oh, okay, how would I help Cecil with this growth opportunity? Uh, then you don't feel as tethered to what we're calling a problem or a growth opportunity where you just are focused on that part of it and not the, what's past it, uh, the, the, the other side of the opportunity. I mean, we've all been there, uh, and it's hard not to take it personally, but uh, it, it, there is a chance to do that sometimes, to let it go and watch it depart and swim out to the sea and say, oh, 
I mean, the fish was never stuck. It was just waiting for the other gate to open. And even though that date gate didn't open, they, that, that fish was still friendly. Uh, so once you found something, find a way to help it. Uh, sometimes that's easier than you think. All you have to do is open your locks and let it go. <laughs> if only, you know. Imagine it drifting away on its way, smiling through the sea. You're happier for meeting the giant friendly fish, and they're happier for meeting you. Swimming on and on and on. Good night, adventurers. Uh, Scoots, I want to thank a couple of patrons that wrote uh, testimonials about being a patron. Pete from Australia, I mentioned before, uh, I knew the podcast was for me when you talked about how listeners deserve a good night's sleep and you're here to help. I also struggle with depression, anxiety, and uh, just make me feel like I'm worthy, come across as a lovely person. I do get lonely at night. I'm single. You're a nice person to listen to. You say some funny things, too. Thanks, Pete. That's awesome, Pete. And then uh, Savannah from Boothby, Maine. Uh, been listening to Sleep With Me on and off for five years, having discovered it while studying abroad for six months. During that time, my struggle with anxiety and homesickness made bedtime very difficult. Sleep With Me was finally a solution for sleep that works for me. The podcast is a tool that I have at my fingertips for those nights that I toss and turn. Scooter's work and companionship is invaluable, which is why I'm happy to Support him and the podcast. So thanks, Pete. Thanks, uh, Savannah, for supporting the show. Sleeping is here for free as because the people that support the show directly or support our sponsors. Uh, so that's why I, I kind of focus on celebrating those people that do that because I really appreciate it. Uh, you could support the show for free, too, by spreading the word about Sleep With Me or we're podcasting, just letting people know, hey, this is what a podcast app is. This, If you want me to show you how it works. You know, soft sell type thing uh, helps everybody. So that's it. And then we got some Tuck You In sponsors uh, after this sometimes. That was what uh, really helped us uh, grow the archives over the past couple of years. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much and good night.